Realise there's a real gap in the market. We want to be in control of our own destiny. Make it something that's not just available as and when it's available. We're, we're becoming the number one wholesaler. We weren't just box shifters, you know, and that's what gave us the edge. Today, the consumer is spoiled with how they shop. Everything we've done is to think about the customers and they can shop while they're sitting on the sofa. But our strategy is differentiating the fragrance. You still need to smell it. They can't have that experience. Hello everybody, welcome to today's podcast, Taking Care of Business. My name is Paul Cheatham Cash, and today I have with me the uh, current CEO and owner of the fragrance shop, Sanjay Videra. Thanks for coming in. Thank you. Really appreciate it. No worries. So today I'm going to ask a little bit about actually your, um, I'm going to go way back to your childhood because I think you've got an interesting story to tell from what I've read about you. We're going to talk a little bit about that, how you've managed to build um, the two businesses you're probably most uh, renowned for doing, how you've bought the trend in retail is something we're going to discuss in a bit more detail. So along kind of your journey, we're going to bring in what retail was like at that point and how it's changed and uh, what the challenges have been and how you've overcome them when other people haven't. So that's how it's going to go. Um, let's start right back then. So you was born in Uganda, I believe. That's right. And um, you moved over here in the 70s. So what was it like, first of all, growing yeah. up in Uganda, I guess? Well, I was very young. Um, I think it was five when, when we were actually booted out um, from Uganda as a family, I think. Idi Amin, who was the, um, the ruler or the president of Uganda, um, had a dream. And in that dream, God had told him, all these Asians that are living in your country are going to take so much economic power they already have, and they're going to control the country. So. He decided in August of 72 um, to tell all the Indians to leave the country and gave them like 60 days. Um, right. So I was about five. What I do remember about Uganda was that we had a very peaceful uh, life, great community around us. My father had uh, established um, like general merchandise stores. He was a franchisee uh, of a large corporation uh, and he had uh, three or four stores that he used to uh, run uh, as part of the family business and um, we had a very much like a community feel so our home was um, where neighbours and friends and family would just come at any time yeah. you'd, you'd, you'd be eating together um, so I do remember picnics a lot of wildlife um, safaris um, great uh, beautiful landscapes uh, yeah. Victoria Falls Victoria Lake you know it's a, a beautiful uh, place Do you ever Uganda. revisit it? Have you ever been back I haven't been back, no. but it's something that I would definitely. So yeah, yes, I'll definitely back there, go yeah. back with my sons uh, at some point in the next few years. Uh, but I haven't. They, uh, when Idi Amin was ousted, um, I think it was '79 um, that he was overthrown. Um, they um, asked for the Asians to come back the new uh, government, and yeah. so we had the right to go and claim back our properties. I was about um, to ask, what happened to the assets and properties and businesses? Well, we, we lost it all and yeah. then there was this whole process after he was ousted that um, in, the Asian families could go back and reclaim their properties and restart again. Oh, okay. and I think what the new government had realised that actually having the Asian communities there made a big difference to the economic state of the yeah. country. Yeah. Um, and actually it was the right direction for them to go back into. So a number of Asians, there was about 80,000 families living there and I think 10,000 remained. Uh, because they were just so powerful, yeah. they, they couldn't yeah. use them. And they had the right to stay in Uganda because they had the citizenships. Sure. People like us who had British citizens, they, they, he basically um, decided that we couldn't stay there. Yeah. So the, the journey from my, my um, memory at the age of five in 72 September, um, my memory of the journey leaving Uganda is, is quite vivid because it was... Um, it was quite traumatic because you were sitting at the back of a car for my sister on one side and my mum in the back. My dad's at the front with the taxi driver who's taking us to the airport and there's a drive of maybe about 200 kilometres uh, to get to the airport Kampala because we used to live um, in, a, in a smaller town outside yeah. of the city. Um, and I do remember that we were travelling and it was at where you get searched at army points and we must have been stopped at maybe about three different points and I remember my mum and dad talking about a number of people who travelled before had got arrested or they were found with uh, possessions okay. and there were, there were stories of people getting shot on the spot and you know so we did get stopped and my dad did get searched and so did my mum so that was a really 
a worrying um, situation uh, that we went through, yeah. and, and I can remember that because I was I was really nervous at the time when they, when it stopped us. Uh, but as part of that journey, um, I was sleeping at the back of the car. I also um, took a bit of a fall, accidentally opened the door by accident, and um, luckily I landed. But I must have been lying on a pillow to give me comfort. Oh, okay. The pillow fell out first and I yeah, landed yeah, yeah, on the yeah. pillow, but I could see this car disappearing into the distance and I just felt that was it. I was left oh, in this jungle. Nightmare. <laughs> you you know, still remember that? Car, and luckily my dad was, I could see my dad holding on to the car and the driver was reversing backwards, but it seemed like, you know, many, many minutes, but it was yeah, 10 yeah, seconds. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um, luckily I, I, I did leave them, my family. <laughs> yeah. Have you wished you have brothers and sisters? Or? Yeah, so I've got a younger brother. He, he was six months old uh, in 72 as we were leaving Uganda. Yeah. And my sister's uh, three years older than me. Oh, okay. So she was eight. Yeah. Okay. So then you got you arrived in the and UK. And then we, we arrived, uh, we chose the UK. We had British yeah. uh, citizenship. Uh, and we arrived in um, London, obviously, and then got transported to Lincoln as refugees. We stayed in a refugee camp for a couple of weeks. Okay. Uh, before my dad um, decided where he was going to uh, make his home. Um, and he decided on Bolton. Um, and number of reasons I suppose one one major one was that his brother was based there one of his brothers uh, and there was great prospect of getting work in textiles mm -hmm. and although my dad was a trained accountant and although he ran obviously businesses before he'd lost his confidence and he just wanted to get back into yeah. work to get some money yeah. um, you know for the family and to put get a roof over our heads um, and get some rental accommodation and then get us into schooling yeah so you grew up in Bolton so we, I grew up in Bolton, yeah. We moved a number of houses um, in the early years as you rent different locations and obviously my parents got work and then we eventually bought a house after a number of, few, number of years because it worked really, yeah. really hard. Yeah. And I remember them working, you know, 12 hour shifts you know, to make sure that the family were looked after. Yeah. And then you left school and uh, what did you, did you know what you wanted to be? Did you have a clue? Well, I think in those days it was, <laughs> common practice between the Asian communities of peer pressure of, you know, doing medicine, doing pharmacy, doing accountancy, yeah. doing a business degree, yeah. doing chemical engineering, computer science was a big thing at the time coming in, but, you know, I had, I had the spectrum uh, computer and I was into using the computer for coding. Um, so I, I, I did A level, all levels obviously and then A levels and yeah. the idea was to go to university uh, and get a degree. Um, but I suppose when I was at school, I, I didn't have a clear idea of what I wanted to become, but I knew I was going to get a profession in something. I had more tendency towards the sciences because uh, I, I did quite well yeah. in school. Um, and then eventually I chose uh, uh, physics with computer science as my course at Manchester Metropolitan oh, okay. University. Yeah. Um, I was great at the GCSEs, but I was not brilliant at A levels. I yeah, levels yeah, okay. passed, the, passed what the, what got to the degree. Um, but I think I picked a course at university which probably was um, more complex than I would than okay. I realize physics and computers. Yeah. I enjoyed the computers part, the physics part, yeah. I probably didn't. So um, I went through it a couple of years, um, but I was looking at doing different things. Yeah. My interests had changed and I wanted to work. I was working in fashion. Um, part time yeah. you know, to make some extra money and I was just looking at other ways of earning income um, yeah. and trying to get distracted away from the course. Sure. I think your first job was in Thai, right? was it? Yeah, yeah, I took that job when I was I think about 15 or 16. Oh, okay. Um, and it was just a, started off as a Saturday job and um, I think what attracted me to that role was first of all I like they were franchisees, the owners had a few tried Thai racks. Oh, okay. I like the owners, I got on really well with them. Um, and the, what I liked about it is, I think I was getting paid two pounds an hour, and then you get 50p commission per tie. And oh, I think okay. that was the bit that I was really yeah. excited about how many yeah. ties I could sell. I think I was yeah. selling like anywhere between 20 and 30 ties in a day. Yeah. You know, made me the yeah, top yeah. salesman. So I was, I was really good at sales, and I just enjoyed meeting different people. And at that time, people still wore ties at work. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so it was still a good thing. Yeah. And you know, yeah. I could see, I could see that I could do quite well in that. But I, I, I took on some extra hours, but I left eventually from there. Then went into fashion yeah. part time while I was still at uni. Okay. So talk to us about fashion and what was it you were doing there? Yeah. So again, sales. Um, I was doing part time work Saturday, Sunday, and then any extra hours that I had outside of university. Was this in lectures. store? Or? This was in store. It was yeah. in the Arndale. It was a retail chain that doesn't exist anymore. Um, 
which is a telling tale of, of retail at the yeah. moment. Uh, Goldberg Retail, they own a company called Riggs uh, Men's and Women's okay. in the Anglo Centre, and I worked in the men's department. So, yeah. you know, a lot of the times I would be running that department, and they gave me the, the keys uh, for the placing, and that was part time. Yeah. Um, I took on quite a bit of responsibility, and I got on really well with the manager. I always hit the targets, everything was always um, good when I was around in the store, in the sense of the sales and that. Um, they were willing to take me on full time if I wanted, uh, yeah. but that wasn't really the career that I wanted to go into. It was nice to just earn a bit of cash when I was at university. However, um, at some point I realized that there was a, a jewelry concession that was there and that jewelry concession disappeared. And uh, that made me think, because I was doing a little bit of trading on the side where I bought some perfume from a wholesale uh, friend of ours that I'd established in London and we would sell um, products um, ad hoc to pharmacies. Yeah. You know, so we would buy, okay. buy some, we'd yeah, sell yeah. a number of pieces to pharmacies um, it, around the sort of northwest area. So I, could, I, I knew I could get supply and I thought, what if I put fragrance in that concession? And that was the whole start of the fragrance idea of started off at retail. Um, yeah. And that's how Percent started uh, as, a, as a brand. Uh, how, we, how long was that after you'd um, sort of graduated and left? I, I didn't graduate. This oh, was okay. in my second year yeah. of university because I was still working part time yeah. um, in the fashion retail. And I got this opportunity to spoke to the manager of the store and said, Look, what's happening to that jewelry concession? Can I take that space? I've got an idea on the do perfume. And she put me in touch with their concessions director yeah. uh, in London, who I set up a meeting with. No idea what I was going to present. But I went there yeah. <laughs> and uh, I think I blagged my way uh, into getting that side in Oxford Street. Can you remember what the deal was? Did you have to pay? £200 pound a week rent. Is that <laughs> what you It wasn't a concession deal where you pay as a percentage. So yeah. that's, that's a mistake that I made. Right. But I was just so happy to have got the deal. Yeah. Um, and then I had to get the right stock assortment, get the unitary. Um, and I think we purchased everything for about £6,000 at the time. Um, and we put the stock in both locations. I had, I had a friend of mine who was very close to me at the time, became my partner, so he would run London and I would run Manchester. Oh, okay. Because he was at university in yeah. London. So this was going to be yeah. a part time thing where we thought we'd put staff in, um, yeah. we'd go and oversee it when we could. Um, I was still working in the middle. So you had to pay for your own staff in the concession? Yeah. 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 I had to pay for our and, and the rent. Yeah. Um, so what? What we realised, it was lucky because when we did the concession, it was running up to Christmas, so it was very oh, busy. Okay, yeah. Did really well. Uh, hit, hit the opening really well, but when it came to January, the sales just came off. Fragrance is very, very, very seasonal. Yeah. Um, and it's very at that time it was very much gifted uh, as a product area. Yeah. And so Christmas was a big, big um, period for sales. And af after that, January, February. You get Valentine and you get Mother's Day, but they're not as big a peak as, as Christmas. Yeah. But it really comes off and you know, you, you start losing money and that's yeah. when you start realising well, what do I do now? Yeah. Um so we had to get rid of the staff and um eventually we bought You're just it. winging it at this point. We're winging yeah, it, yeah. we're winging it, totally winging it. We're learning as as we go yeah. along. So we you know, we're we're obviously having to pay the supplier who's giving us credit, we're yeah. making sure that we're keeping him happy at the same time. Yeah. We had to lay off the staff and manage the concessions ourselves. That's when I had to leave the university course. Oh, okay. Uh, and then full time focus on this. And then what we realised that actually we could do the, the wholesaling on the side to basically facilitate the gap we've got yep. um, in the on, the on the expenses. Yeah. And we started wholesaling to pharmacies a bit more because we had more time, so we we're focusing them on them a lot more. And then what happened was we shut down. Um, the two concessions uh, gave them notice because it wasn't paying and it was only a Christmas um, uh, situation. Yeah. So we focused full time on the trading side and then the guy who was a wholesaler in London said, why don't you both come and work with me? I've got a lot, lot more stock, base yourselves in London, I'll show you the ropes and um, I'll give you profit share. Okay. And we thought, great, well, hey, somebody else puts the capital up, yeah. we'll learn how to run the business, we've got the stock supply. He didn't have a distribution at that point, but he had the access to the product because yeah. he had a number of pharmacies that yeah. he could buy the stock from the brands from. And are you working for him then at this point? Yeah, so we took a, we took, um, a salaried role with him, mm -hmm. uh, plus expenses, plus a profit share based on 20% or whatever we yep. put profit-wise, we would get the share. And um, we did that for about six months um, but we realised that we weren't getting um, 
paid our expenses on time. There was all sorts of issues with our salaries yeah. paid, being paid on time. And we thought, well, we're building a business. We built, I think we built a three and a half, four million pound business within that six month really? period. Yeah, but very, very quickly. Who was your customers? Who were you selling? Pharmacies. So we, in we the main? Like, yeah, in the main pharmacies, plus a little bit of wholesaling to other wholesalers in different parts of the country. Um, and we'd established all these as new customers um, for, for this gentleman. And we just realized that we're doing all this work. There's no guarantee that we're ever going to get paid properly. And we want to be in control of our own destiny, in essence. And I contacted a friend of mine in Manchester um, who was going to be my mentor for the future. And I said to him, look, this is the problem we've got. We've got the ability to really start a nice business here. And um, would you give us some advice? Would you give us some office space for mm -hmm. a short period of time? And then when we start making money, we'll start paying you. And he was like, absolutely no problem at all. Um, come and see me next week. And we'll finalize everything. Yeah. Um, and I went to see him the week after, um, agreed everything. He gave us a, he gave us an office and warehouse space. Um, they were in the wine business and um, they had more uh, space than they required. Yeah. So it worked out quite well. Um, and we basically left, gave notice to the other guy and left and started off. And where did you find the supply chain? Because obviously he was... So we, we'd obviously, within that six months, yeah. we found a network of suppliers um, in the UK and a couple overseas. Um, and what we'd realized by that time of the six months that we'd worked in is that there's a real gap in the market of somebody doing this really professionally. Rather than it just being something you pick up the phone buy a thousand pieces of this or 200 pieces of this, we should create a range um, that we can hold as a core product range uh, for percent on an ongoing yeah. basis. Yeah. And then we offer a service um, to a number of retailers, pharmacies, retail chains, um, and possibly other wholesalers as well. And, you know, we professionalize it in the way we offer it. So we make it something that's not just available as and when it's available. You actually have a range that's available for, for a retail oh, okay. to replenish yeah. on an ongoing basis. Yeah. And that's how Percent as a business started off yeah. uh, from a wholesale operation. And so your suppliers, are they, are they, are you have got many suppliers at this point? Are you going at Probably got about a dozen suppliers about this okay. time you know that we'd established yeah and are um, they global because well at that time it was mainly uk and maybe a couple okay. overseas but yeah once we'd set up sure. um in manchester we decided that we'd travel around the world because it, we operated in the gray market and the way the gray market operates is we were in fragrances so we were fortunate enough that the product was the same all around the world as a global product um, yeah. and every product's got a barcode, a UPC code Yeah. and the packaging, the fragrance, everything's the same uh, and the sizing is the same as well uh, throughout the markets. Uh, obviously you've got different markets that might be better at certain fragrances or brands yeah. because of the ma market demographic Yeah. Uh, but generally the, the brands are the same. And, and because that's all the same, are you, a f are you buying it more or less the same? Well this is not? where the opportunity arises because you've got um, distributors around the world, uh, you've got different currency um, arbitrations uh, between the different markets and different pricing levels mm -hmm. and we were taking advantage of those um, you know, oh, okay. differences yeah. to, to our effects. If the pound was really strong from a certain market currency, yeah. we, we've got that advantage plus if the distribution pricing levels were different on the, and retail, retail pricing levels, because certain markets are priced lower than other markets yeah. and we were taking advantage of that situation. Um, at the time, so we we travelled extensively over the next three to four years, uh, and at that time there was no online, so you'd go to the check into a hotel, you'd pick up the yellow pages, yeah, and you'd look under the perfumes and cosmetics section, and you'd bring every single supplier yeah. in town. Yeah, you got time to meet us, yeah, and then you explain who you are. And you know, the most important thing is we would only deal with authorised distributors or retailers, so we knew that the goods were genuine. Yeah, so we get you know comfort that we weren't dealing. With with the rural traders yeah. in any way. So our name was going to be really important and reputation was really important. So we had to deal with established, um, bona fide, authorized distributors. Yeah. And then how did you build your customer base? So once we, uh, the supply side was one part and then, you know, having this ability to get a range of products in place, we then started, uh, obviously with the pharmacies originally, uh, then we went to the retail chains like Superdrug was our mm -hmm. first contract. Okay. Um, they were, not able to get supply directly from the brands at the time. 
because they were seen as a discount retail store. Yes. And most of the brands around mm. Europe work under a, a, what they call a selective distribution agreement, which means that you have to meet a number of qualitative criteria, um, similar to branded sportswear or high-end fashion. Um, and you need to tick those boxes before the brands will supply you. Sure. And they didn't see Superdrug uh, meeting those requirements right. in those early days. And that gave us an opportunity to say, okay, we can supply you a range on a consistent basis. And that's where we started. When it came to a chain of that size, we started offering category management services. So this is where a retailer who's got a large assortment of different categories, the buyer is buying quite a cross path of different mm. product areas and fragrance is still a nominal part of their yeah. business. And they don't really have the time to do the range selection, the merchandising plans, the training aspect, the promotional plans. And we started offering a main menu of services um, to all these retailers and Superdrug was the first one that we signed up as a contract um, from a supply base. How did you, was it, did you have problems at that stage funding it or? Um, what we would, we use the old adage, we, when we, set up percent um, both me and my partner we yeah. went to our dads to get um, facilities to the bank and the banks would only give us facilities if they put their houses on the sure. line and I think our starting position was about £25,000 as long as both houses were on the line yeah, yeah. which was a very small amount of overdraft for the value of the equity that was that had. an easy conversation it, with your dad it, it, with my dad it was it was an easy conversation because he had faith and trust in me yeah. and I think him bestowing that trust in me allowed me to make sure that I didn't let him down, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. which made it easier for me. So I didn't feel the pressure. Um, I think both of us, both me and my partner, were lucky that our dads were able to support us. That gave us that opportunity. Um, and so the forty, th then it went to forty thousand pounds as an overdraft facility. But I think because the number of hoops we had to jump with the banks to try and keep them happy, we decided that you know within a certain one or two years, we'd want to finance everything ourselves and we'd want to try and take the banks out of the yeah. equation and, yeah. uh, unless we really needed them at the peak period. Yeah. You know, and, and try and run a business that was cash um, rich um, and not use facilities unless we are absolutely required to do so. Yeah. Um, so we ensured that we didn't take any salaries out of the business, we only took expenses out. That was a needs must be. We both lived at our parents' houses. You know, so we didn't have any outgoings. So the first three to four years, I think we were probably drawing maybe two hundred pound a week or something. Right. You know, hardly any money. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you started in 90, 1990? 1990s, 1%. And then, yeah. then your first few years, like you say, you it's yellow pages. It's going through. It's sa selling. And then, did it? How, how did it continue, or why, why did the business model change over that period of time? Did you? Was you, was you always so, selling so, so to the, pharmacies? So I think the super drug, um, the contract we had with them really opened up the opportunity with other retailers. It put us in a different scale because yeah. we were supplying millions of pounds of the goods to them. Yeah. You know, so and are you, you buying know, better then as we're well? We're buying better, we're sourcing really good. You know, we're, we're becoming like the number one wholesaler in, in the UK oh, by okay. this time. So it was on, it was, so we've gone, if we look at 98, this is when I, split with my partner, bought him out, and my brother came into the business just a year before. Um, and my brother came in to run the sales side of the business and I focused on the buying side. So we split the business into two areas. Okay. Uh, and what my brother did was um, bring in retailers like Asda, uh, Tesco, all the big retail chain stores into the cash flow management side. Yeah. So he really helped with that side while I focused on building brand relationships. Yeah. Because by that time, although we started off great market, we started to go directly to a, a number of brands, uh, and a number of brands then realised that we were at a scale now, rather than us buying goods from yeah. other markets, they would want to supply us. Because they may not supply us all the strategic brands, but they they wanted to supply us an assortment okay. um, that would allow us to then supply into the retail distribution that we had. And you're wholly in the UK at that point, or mainly? Wholly in the UK. Yeah. We did a bit of trading um, on exports, but it was probably about 10% of our business around that time. Yeah. You know, so it was majority UK-based retail distribution. Yeah. And the team, because you mentioned before, was mainly you and your partner. And My partner had left by 98, and yeah. then around 98 onwards, we'd built a different team, because um, we'd split the partnership. Um, and it was my brother and myself, and we built a team around us. Yeah to focus on what percent was going to be going forward. Yeah. 
Um, yeah. What kind of revenue was you doing in 98, so that eight years? So, uh, 98 was probably about 30, 32 million to yeah. about 35 million. Yeah. And the supermarkets are taking up quite a yeah, Chunk supermarkets came in after 98, 99. Yeah. So they were more like 2000, 2001. Yeah. Sort of thing. And then what was it? Just more the same business model, more growth, build a team? Yeah, more. so it was, we were getting better at what we did in the sense of how to understand what the retailers really look for. We were more analytical with data. So we were looking at selling and sell out. We were working with retailers and partnering with them so that the result was that they didn't just buy the product from us, but we actually made sure they sold it as well. So we help them with the analytics of what was working, what wasn't working. Yeah. What do we need to do to help you to get rid of that stock? If we need to do a pull more on it, or if we need to do a markdown on it. Yeah. So we work with a number of retailers in different ways. Yeah. You know, some retailers were really good, and some retailers needed a bit more help. So we had a menu of options. Um, so we want we weren't just box shifters. We were actually added value sure. distributors, you know, and that's what gave us the edge. Um, against other and you were the biggest the at that point we, yeah we got to a point where we we became the biggest around the sort of mid 2000s yeah. yeah was there a period in that time where was it just incremental success or was it a roller coaster ride what was it like in for those 10 years it, it was a bit of a roller coaster I think you you just have that buzz of just growing the business and taking on I think you know it was exciting at the early stages when you're getting a million pound check and you take a picture of it and put it on the wall yeah, that's yeah. your first million pound check and and afterwards the, you'll be on social media now <laughs> you know, <laughs> well after you've had that it, yeah. I suppose the buzz starts disappearing because yes. you've done it once you tick the box and I think then it becomes a norm right and then yeah. you're just focused on other areas yeah and I think you just want to make sure you serve the customers well you deliver well you buy well and you get your cash in well and you don't have any bad debts and you think you focus on all those areas and you yeah. try to make that as best you can. So, Was yeah, there ever was a bad good. debt moment you can remember or something where you thought was close to the wind or? Um, nothing that yeah. that would, I would say was material enough sure. to have changed the course of the business in yeah. any way, shape or form. Yeah. You know, we've had bad debt, but small amounts. Yeah, yeah. You know. yeah. So then 2005, I think, you part sold out. Um, is it a finish? Uh, Icelandic. Icelandic, yeah. So we around 2004, we did, took a strategic review of the business. Um, you know, there was now uh, a quite a bit of our supply coming through brands um, directly. Some of it was traded still off the grey market. We had great retail customer base, um, and we were trying to build our own brands within the business as well. Um, no um, own stores, I guess. No, no stores. No concessions. This, um, so let me. Uh, I think we had about four stores under Perfume Point, where we'd open our own okay. stores. Um, that was the brand, Perfume Point? Perfume Point, yeah, that was within Percent. So it was just four stores that we, we supplied for Percent. Um, um, I, I took on Percent um, to one of those stores. And the idea was we might expand them, but we were, we were just trying and dabbling back into retail. Yeah. Um, but Percent was the key focus, um, and our other retail partners were the key focus. So we took a strategic review, and we decided at that time we may look at doing a name flotation. So we went through the full process, um, but did the roadshow, yeah. um, and we were told of a valuation we would get, which at the point of when we finished the roadshow, um, markets were a bit dicey, so we we were given a discount of around 20% of the original okay. uh, intended price. Uh, and one of the members of my board um, at the time said, look, you, you don't have to go down the public route. Um, on the basis that you know, you're now getting discounts as well. There is another option. Um, there's an Icelandic entrepreneur who's got a pharmaceutical business and he's expanding massively. There was a number of Icelandic entrepreneurs at the time yeah. quite, you know, quite busy with expansion, yeah. and especially across the UK. And um, he'd like to meet up. I mentioned that you're going through this process and he'd, re he'd be really interested to have a chat. And his business and your business very similar because he does pharmaceutical distribution mm -hmm. in Iceland and a number of other countries around that region. Um, and he believes that the two businesses could fit well because well, he, he shared the, um, at the time, the uh, Pathfinder yeah. um, with him. Um, so he, he was going to be an investor as well, if, even if he didn't sell in the business. So uh, we had a meeting with him and he, he really liked the business and he said, well, I'll I'll pay you the price 
um, based on the discount you're yeah. getting offered yeah. Yeah. Um, on in, but it'll be private, so therefore you're going to have to go through the process. Yeah. And I think we pretty much agreed the deal and then it went through a due diligence process. Yes. But a lot of the work had been done on the sure. so he was quite yeah, comfortable, yeah, yeah, so he yeah. did his own yeah. mini due diligence. Yeah. Um, and then we went through a legal process and he bought 70% of the business. Okay. Uh, where I kept where I kept thirty percent yeah. uh, share in the business yeah, and um, just going back to the four retail outlets you had because um, you then went on to do more in your new in your, in your current project. How did how was they faring was it so and where was they and you would give it a trial and then you you'd overcome there was a recession in that nineteen ninety to two thousand five. I'm not quite sure when it was. Nineteen nineties, early nineteen nineties there was a bit of a recession. That's was you recession started. proof through that or I think they always say that you may have heard in the beauty sector they call it the lipstick effect, where a woman will never go without her lipstick, no matter how bad the times are. She yeah. still needs that lippy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I think it's similar to fragrance. I won't say it's recession proof, but it definitely has a resistance to recession yeah. on the basis that it's the cheapest entry price point into luxury product. Yeah. yeah. Because anything else above that is that like sure. sunglasses, handbags, etc. Yeah. etc. Et so yeah. you know, you can buy a fragrance anywhere from twenty pounds to a hundred pounds. So yeah. you know, and it's the brands that you can't afford the other parts to sometimes. Sure. So it's a good entry point. Yeah. And I think once somebody is using a particular fragrance mm -hmm. um, it's something they're going to continue wanting to wear um, it becomes a second skin yeah it makes them feel in a certain way it's quite an emotional purchase and it's yeah. part of their normal routine yeah so we'll talk about the exit then for a second um, how did it feel was that uh, we've had very exciting on. when it happened <laughs> yeah um, but I felt like nothing had changed because I was still running the business yeah. I still had 30 percent stake yeah. that the dynamics had changed because I now had a board structure yeah. with different shareholding, yeah. um, which I was a shareholder on that yeah. board. Did uh, you feel successful at that point? Did it taste like what you thought it was going to be at the time? Um, yeah, I felt success. It, I felt the success on the basis that we aborted the aim flotation and then okay. found another yeah. exit route, which yeah. was which was quite good in a sense because we didn't have to wait long yeah. at all. Yeah. And we found that opportunity, uh, but the success wasn't in the part of the, the level of money we took out yeah i suppose when people are looking um at us from the from outside they probably saw that oh he's done really well selling a wholesale business yeah you know that he built from nothing and yeah. th that hadn't been done within our sector in the wholesale sector yeah um, so i suppose it is an achievement in that sense uh, but there's been many businesses since then that yeah. have been sold, yeah. but we yeah. may have been one of the first ones yeah. in the sector so then, I think that was 2005, 2006, you bought the fragrance shop. Yes. So you, did you buy it with a consortium or? Yeah, so this was strange. So we, I built up a, a relationship with the original founder of the fragrance shop. Um, at the time when he had it, he then sold it to the Peacocks group. We were a supplier from Percent into the mm -hmm. fragrance shop, but small supplier. We had a relationship on the back of that. Um, Peacocks bought it at 29 stores. Um, from the original founder, and then after two years, they took it, taken it to 90 stores. And oh, okay. Peacocks went through a, a process from being listed to becoming a private company uh, with, a, with a number of funds as shareholders. Um, and I think they made the decision uh, that it didn't fit strategi strategically in their vision going forward. Mm -hmm. And they contacted the original founder to see if he'd buy it back, um, who, con who contacted me and said, Look, Sanjay, um, got this opportunity would you be interested okay um, but I don't want to buy it by myself if, if we buy it let's buy it together and yeah. I can club a couple of other people and I said well yeah it's very interesting I'm still CEO of percent I've got a 30% stake I'm sure I'm conflicted in buying this business so I'll yeah. have to get my yeah. sign off from yeah, the Icelandic yeah. guy um, and when I when I contacted Carl um, he said as long as I can come in and buy it with you okay. guys, <laughs> yeah. um, I'm happy to do it. Um, so we, we bought the business, Bill and I had owned the majority of the stake and Carl yeah. and another investor yeah. owned a minority stake. And you had 90, you had 90 stores at the time? And had 90 stores at the time. All in yeah. the UK, I think? All in the UK, yeah. yeah. It, was, it, was, it was probably just about break even, um, okay. I would say. Uh, but it was on the verge of going into losses. Right. Yeah. 
Because it had pretty high growth, obviously. In yeah, it, it, well, it, the profit, well, when I think, when the original founder had sold it, he got it, sold it at a profit stage, but when they'd driven out the number of stores and locations, it had started to um, just go flat, I think, although the turnover had massively yeah. increased. So you just tried four stores in percent and decided to... Well, we were at nine stores by this time. Oh, okay, in percent? Yeah, percent yeah of course, because it was a stores, gap. Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. so you were yeah. starting to roll out yeah, yeah. stores anyway, yeah. so you were seeing that they were working. Yeah. And, um, okay, then you end up with 90, break even. What are the what are the challenges, I guess, at that point? What are the... I was still based in Manchester. Uh, the fragrance shop was located in Liverpool. Um, that's where the head office was, so I would usually go there for the trading meeting on a Monday. My remit was, we were joint CEOs, uh, the, the original founder myself, and we ran it together. He, obviously, he understood the business intrinsically because he'd started it property-wise, and the management team were people pretty much the same as who he had instilled from the beginning. Yeah. Um, and I would be the person who would be helping with more on the product side, relationships with the brand, seeing how we can negotiate better margin structure, because that's where my yeah. experience was in yeah. a big way. I really understood you know, the different dynamics on, on product and brand relationships and how to get better margin structures. Um, and then there was the distribution side, because Percent distributed to yeah. a number of retailers in the fragrance sector. Um, we were very good at that side and the category management aspect, and so we had good you know, capabilities within our fulfillment centre to take in. It the didn't harm percent in the marketplace no. that you was. Well, we at the beginning the brands were a little bit cautious about what's going on here. Are you going to mm. buy products from percent? Mm. Or are you going to buy from mm. the brands? So we had to we had to do a, a series of meetings, you know, to just make them feel comfortable. That, you know, this was going to be run separately, two separate businesses, separate management teams, separate companies. That ownership structures were different, yeah. You know, so nothing was going to harm the interests of where the fragrance shop was going to go yeah. in, in its future yeah. prospects. And yeah. what we wanted to do was get a better footing with the brands, better relationships, and um, we wanted to really drive the business forward. How many staff did you have in percent at that point? I think at percent we had probably about 35 to 40 staff. And how many did you have in fragrance shop? Fragrance shop probably would have been about 450, 500. Yeah. How did you find that? Was that a massive difference or? Yeah, I suppose, uh, like I said, because I wasn't fully running the business, it was still very much about, I was just focused on the product and the okay. distribution. And he and was getting, doing people in the get, asset. Yeah, he, he was managing profit. that because we, we managed it as a joint thing um, for a period of time. How long did, how long did it, so, I don't, he's not. Yeah, so it was end of 2006 when we bought the fragrance shop yeah. and I bought everybody out by 2008. Okay. Including the freight, the percent business back again. <laughs> oh, right. Okay. Okay. Cal. So you bought Cal. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So at that point, 2008, and it's pretty good times anyway. It was yeah. just, uh, yeah, beginning of 2008. Then you complete that transaction, and then then we hit a recession. So what do you think yeah. at that point? Are you still okay? Or? <laughs> I think the, the, the time was coming to a point where the banking collapses were happening. So I'm just about to got the businesses in my control um, and it allowed me to use the backdrop in a way to restructure the business okay uh, not go through any formal process but yeah. to be able to use a carrot and stick type of approach where on the retail side it allowed me to relocate to Manchester the offices we yeah. restructured the, the, you know, the people side obviously went through consultation process a lot you know gave people the opportunity to move if they wanted to um, and then we went to bat on every aspect of the other areas of the business, property, you know, so we went, looked at all what we felt were all rented leases. Yeah. Because you, when you've got a retailer who opens the 29 to 90 stores yeah. over a, yeah. a two year period, they're just signing leases and as long as they're getting the rent incentives and yeah. whatever, they're not, because everything's flying at that time in retail, more or less. And we thought that was an opportunity. Um, with the backdrop of the recession um, and what was happening in the marketplace to negotiate our position, and um, and we did we did quite well. We managed to get you know a couple of million quid's worth of savings. Um, did you shrink back the profit portfolio, or did you keep the ninety open? Or I think we ended up only closing three oh, four okay. stores. Yeah, yeah. So out of all all that yeah. exercise, it put the fragrance shop in a very strong position. 
you know, going forward. Yeah. Um, by negotiating um, those over rented leases yeah. and getting. And you wasn't relying on banks. Yes. So well, we we had a we had a uh, a bridging loan um, that was um, tied in when we did the original acquisition yeah. with the consortium, which I took over. Um, so we were at that point where we were just in the verge of, you know, breaching covenants. Yeah. Um, just because of the time it was taking to, you know, go through this process. Yeah. Th th this was taking place from before I even did the acquisition. But, you know, the numbers were coming through. It was a steady business. It was just yeah. making sure that all the all the other parts that we were going to work on were coming through, you know, soon enough yeah. you know, to help the bottom line. Obviously, there's a lot of negativity going about at this point. So are you not worried that you've just had kind of a backing of Carl? You've got, you mentioned before, the, the, the gentleman, that founder of uh, the fragrance shop, he's looking after the people and the property portfolio, which was very much his bag. Yeah. Was you not worried or I was stressed? Really, I was or? really worried that I wasn't a person that had run a large enough retail chain. We were now at 90 stores, right? And yeah. I'd only run nine, so I wasn't really yeah. running them. I, I had somebody running them for me, so. What I was, what I was capable of doing is understanding the business. I was good at finance. I was good at looking at product, looking at where we could make shifts, looking at underinvestment in areas, and seeing where the gaps were. Yeah. And I could. It's business is common sense, and you just look at things and you think, what well, what can we make right? Getting the right team in place was really important. So you know, first and foremost, I wanted to make sure I had the right management team in place and secured myself a new managing director who came from a retail background, who understood property, who understand, understood how to grow a retail business. Yeah. You know, and um, although I would know what to do from a vision perspective, I wanted somebody to handle the day-to-day, -day, yeah. you know, make sure that they knew every aspect of what was going on in the business. What was your management team then at that point? Then? So we had, a, we had a managing director, retail director, um, field structure across the yeah. retail estate, finance director, financial controller at the time. Um, uh, marketing, head of marketing. Uh, we didn't have e-commerce at the time. Uh, yeah. You know that was something that we started. So when I when we bought the fragrance shop, there was no e-commerce. Right. It was a traditional bricks and mortar retail business, but we knew that was something to build as a channel. Yeah. And what was your strategy then at this point? So you got it all back, and what was what did you see the strategy? Because everybody else is closing stores, closing yeah. shops. And that's happened ever since, to be honest. But as they've closed stores, you've opened them because I think you've got over 200 now. Yeah, so I think the most important thing was that you get your foundation really strong. And um, when we bought the business, it had come from a strong rooted foundation. Um, one of the key assets of the business when we bought the business, and this was when we did the due diligence of walking the stores, was the passion that was instilled in the people. And I think that was down to the original founder. He really built up a good people network yeah. within yeah. the stores and the passion was there. It was run like a family business. So yeah. what I really liked was that passion that these store teams had and what they wanted was the support, the infrastructure, the communication, the training. Yeah. You know, give them all that and they can really do wonders for you. And I think that's the most important thing that I saw as an asset and I, what we wanted to do was support all those stores because that's where the sales happen. Yeah in the best way we could. So we invested in technology, we invested in communication systems, we invested in real-time systems, looking at data, real-time make decisions by data rather than just winging it, thinking on this yeah. is what it seems like. Yeah. Um, and we gave them training, you know, investment, massive training investment. So we did training programs with the brands, conferences, roadshows. Um, you know, we then looked at stores and looked at how can we improve the stores in the sense of the fit out, the quality of the fittings, uh, make sure the merchandising and the planning grabbing was done to the highest level from a brand perspective. So, you know, we ticked all the boxes from a brand uh, experience point of view, an image point of view, so that they were happy. And we yeah. wanted to make sure that everything we did was consistent um, across the board in every store you would walk. You would see the planning grabbing the same for the brand's perspective yeah. and, the, and the marketing uh, hotspots that we would have in promotions and, you know, what we drive product wise was the same across the system. So if that's all the positives that you was doing, I guess is the kind of anti that where everyone else is going wrong. Because you look around and a lot of the retailers, you know, I think this, and I'd be interested in your opinion on this, because Toys R Us close. And somebody goes, can't believe Toys R Us has closed. And I say, well, I can. 
because it's not moved on from when I went to Toys R Us in 1985 when I was, you know, when I was a kid. So I can understand why Debenhams might not be uh, right. doing so well. Because the same as when I walked in it in 1989, yeah. they don't seem to have moved. What's your thoughts on it? So you now talking about the current time, what's happening in yeah, the current um, today? Yeah, everything you've just... Dis- yeah, 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 how it's moved really, yeah. Uh, look, I think today uh, the consumer is spoiled with how they shop. When I bought the fragrance shop, the online was just about starting off, but it obviously is projected fast in the sense of sales and convenience from a customer point of view. So today the customer can go on their mobile phone and search out a product within seconds and they can shop while they're sitting on their sofa um, or they can see where's the nearest store, they can compare price. Yeah. And the only reason they would want to go to a store is because they can't have that experience on the phone. Yeah. And with fragrance you still need to smell it. You still need to touch the product, see how it feels. You might want to see what the packaging like. You might want to see what the bottle's like. Yeah. So unless you know exactly what you want and you're replenishing, you know, it's something you won't get that experience. And fragrance is still an impulsive purchase. And one of the key uh, aspects of fragrance shop as a retailer format is that we position our stores in the highest footfall areas within the shopping mall. You know, we open up the store so there's no doorways, nothing yeah. to have a barrier for you to get into the store and the brands are shouting out loud from within the store. Yeah. You know, so the brand advertising, obviously marketing is massive out there in the sense of TV, uh, radio, digital, print, yeah. and brands speak for themselves and we call yeah. the fragrance shop. So you know, people understand who we are and they're walking past and they're tempted to walk in and try our fragrance yeah. as an impulsive purchase. So that's an experience you can't give online. You know, that whole aspect of trialing a number of different fragrances. Yeah. And seeing how that makes you feel from an emotional perspective. Because it is, a fragrance is different on you as it is different on me, as it is different on somebody else. Yeah. And how they feel about it. Yeah. Everybody's different in what they might like. How did you then go then, I guess, from 90 stores to, is it 225 or something you have today? Yeah, we're at 200 now. We yeah. closed down the House of Fraser uh, oh, okay. stores, which yeah. were, we were at 220. Yeah. Odd. Um, yeah. Uh, that was until the end of February. Yeah. So about 200 stores now. And how did you go about that? I mean, it was quite aggressive. It's aggressive growth, isn't it, over Yeah, so we, once we got the foundation set up right, we got the formula right in the sense of how we're going to lay out the stores, how's the training going to work. You have a clear strategy of the drivers that really make this business work. Yeah. And then you plan for that three-year st- strategy um, and you deliver on that. Part of that was a store opening program. Part of that was building online yeah. as a channel. Yeah. becoming a multi-channel business yeah. and that's what we did for a number of years and everything we've done is to think about the customer so you know we we want to be um, our vision is to be the first for fragrance and part of that vision is to be the first for customer yeah uh, first for uh, brand brands and our brand partnerships and first for our, our, our employees yeah in the business as well so those are the strands that we work okay. across and we built a culture around that based on four facets really passion innovation expertise and simplicity and that's how we've driven the business over the last number of years yeah you know along those cultural values cultural values do you think size of property is important you look at what someone like house of <laughs> fraser do you just think it's sheer size is size part of its downfall do you think or yeah i think if you look at today's world you don't it's a minefield to go into department store that's mm. like fifty thousand square feet plus because like I said, it's convenient now to just shop on your mobile phone yeah. and if Amazon can deliver it and make it, if it's a functional purchase, it makes it easy. Um, so department stores are more for experience and it's the experiential part that you would go for in, into a department store yeah. rather than going for a functional item. You know, and, and I think you want to touch and feel, you want to explore. There's got to be a sensory or, or an experience that you get. It's got to be deeply engaging for a consumer yeah. um, and I think some of the department stores have not managed to do that because maybe you're not ability to invest any further in the, in the capex in the, in the stores yeah. um, because of the long leases they've signed because of the debt levels that they've got yeah. you know, and the sheer size of the stores um, you know, really doesn't make it able for them to do that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Online then, obviously I guess it's a big part of your business now or it's becoming bigger um, I guess the growth in the online is far more than the growth offline in yeah. the stores. 
Uh, how how was it? What was it like getting to grips with that and identifying it? Was you one of the first in? For some people, there was even for big brands, it was quite a big time, like, wasn't there? For- yeah, I think we were a little bit later on because I bought the fragrance shop sort of end of 2006. We didn't really get the site going till sort of 2010 mm-hmm. properly. Um, you know, so I, I think we were much later down the lines. And I think the first mistake everybody makes when they run an e-commerce business coming from a traditional retail background is that you run it as a silo. So you run yeah. it as a shop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's like its own team and it does its own marketing things. And, yeah. you know, so it's become intrinsic now. Yeah. That, you know, we run one marketing across the board, no matter whether it's online or in-store. It's a multi-channel yeah. business. And, you know, the customer now, 70% of our customers come on the website through their mobile phone. And then they decide how they're going to shop with us. So they see if we've bought the stock, what's yeah. the price? Is it convenient to click and collect it? Yeah. You know, we can do that in 30 minutes or what's the quickest delivery time if yeah. they want to just yeah. get it at home or what's the nearest store they can pick it up from. Yeah. You know, so that that's how the shop works now. So marketing is holistic um, and 360 now. So we don't just focus on traditional against online. It's, it's now managed as yeah. a... You think they, somebody comes in store, they try a new perfume, I guess they, they try and... Um, they try before they buy, they buy it from you. Do you think you, do you then have to just still be as careful about price online or do you think that brand loyalty is, well, it's, this is my perfume for now and, and, and when I need to replenish, I'll go online well, and buy it from Frank Shop or do you have to be careful still with price? We've always been clear about pricing policy. Uh, online and store is the same. So we okay. see it as one, one business yeah. and you know we don't want the customer yeah. ever to get caught out where online is cheaper than our store and yeah. then get offended by it. So yeah. it's one pricing policy. Of course, there's a competitor la- landscape out there. What we do do in store um, is if customers come to our store and you know they challenge the price on something because they've seen it 100 feet away, slightly cheaper because somebody's on promotion. As long as they're an authorized retailer, um, we will match that price. Yeah. We've got systems in place yeah. which allows them um, and will save them their legs yeah. having to go down one match at yeah. that time just for cons- cons- custom convenience but we can't we can't be cheaper than everybody out there because everybody's got different programs that they're running from a marketing point of view generally we're competitive to the landscape yeah but i wouldn't say we're the cheapest out there yeah you know, so we're, we're good value for money yeah you've had quite um heavy growth so um how have you kind of managed that um the decision because usually what comes with growth is investment and the lack of profit so it usually hits the bottom line growing the top line yeah. how have you balanced that over uh, over the 10 years or so we've obviously invested massively in uh, new stores refurbishment yeah. so capex has been quite big um you know over the over the years we, we were opening anywhere between 10 to 20 stores a year any one time um, and we've invested massively in the technological part of our platforms and anything that really enables uh, the business to become a lot more free to foot and streamlined so any technology that enables us to do that yeah. um, we've invested in so but we've been lucky enough where the business has been been growing in profitability every single year well that slash it was was a lot more tougher but uh, every other year has been consistent growth, double digit on profit. Yeah. Um, you know, we've grown the top line, you know, if not double digit, at least single digit yeah. on a turnover basis. So we've had the ability because of the growth to be able to reinvest back into the business in the yeah. areas that really matter. Yeah. Yeah. You talked about the customer experience in store and you, you're opening um, sniff bars, I think you call them. What, what, what are those? Um, so. <laughs> There's this whole aspect of there's the online shopper who gets the experience online but doesn't actually get the physical experience and then you've got the physical experience in the store in the traditional retail format yeah and it was trying to bring that hybrid model across uh, which physical digital added together becomes digital yeah and sniff bar for us was how can we get in a location as a pop-up um, where we get transient traffic, we're moving traffic, it could be a mall, it could be a railway station, it could be an event space, and we can have the 80-20 rules, so 20% make 80% of your sales range available for, from a brand perspective for the consumer to quickly touch, feel, trial, 
test. Buy it yeah. on the mobile phone if they want to, or buy it through the tablet uh, with our brand ambassador. But still get that full immersive experience of you know the fragrance and the brand image and everything displayed in the right way from a brand perspective. Um, and they get that product delivered to their home in a way that they will from an e-commerce perspective so okay. the next day. So the, the physical aspect of the product, they don't take away there and then we give them a little sample, yeah. which basically allows them to use it until they receive the product the next day. I see. And you're rolling them out now? Well, we did three Coming before Christmas. Up. So they were a yeah. pop-up pop okay. uh, and they did really well. Um, what, so the other, the other way you've got to look at this is if I spend on media, um, let's say bus stop advertising with the fragrance shop advert, with the latest brands we've got, yeah. what's the difference in me taking a position in the mall where I've got a similar sort of footage, yeah. um, but I'm actually able to sell and get the brand awareness out there. So I see it as a media opportunity, not yeah. only for us, but for the brands. Yeah. But at the same time, there's a possibility of us to do, being able to do a sale. Yeah. It's interesting you say that because when you're doing on digital marketing, yeah. you'll get your reports uh, from, the, from the, the agencies or the e-commerce team, and it will be about how many impressions and so on and so forth. That and that's exactly that the analytics there. we were sharing with the brands. You know, we were yeah. showing them how many people interacted with their brands, how many people then clicked onto the QR codes, came onto the website, yeah. how many people then returned and bought the product. Yeah. So it actually holistically helps the whole business. So even if they've spent five minutes at the sniff bar, yeah. that experience, if they didn't purchase there, they've come yeah. back onto the website and bought again, or they've gone into the store and bought it later on. Yeah. Or even if they've walked past it every day that yeah. week. Yeah. It's like, it seems brand, like it's a no-brainer to me. brand, brand me. awareness so gets there as well. I've always thought that, I mean, Misguided tried it, but it's not yeah. worked. So when they yeah. did it, I thought, actually, that's a really good idea. Yeah. I think they pulled away from that now. But it seems to, to make sense to me that people would walk past them every day the next time they want to buy a dress yeah. or a fragrance or book a holiday. Um, but it's, it doesn't seem to have worked as, as much as, what, a few years ago I thought it might have yeah. done. But it is for you, though. Yeah, but the, we're only taking, like... 150 square feet yeah, maximum. Yeah. We're not taking up a lot of space. But that's perfect, yeah, isn't it's it? Perfect from a from a cost model. We're we're also pop up, so we you know we would only cover the peak periods or events events times where we know there's a lot of footfall. Yeah. And I suppose it's like maximizing advertising. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, if you can get a sale. Yeah. That's 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 an extra. Yeah. You generally then, um, you seem to take seem to eat have took all this in your stride. Some people do, some people don't. How have you found like a steady progress? If, do you work on self-development? Has it just come naturally? How do you cope with stresses? Are you, is, it, is that natural or have you had to work on? I think there's stuff? a fine balance um, having a good family life, support system at home. Yeah. Um, obviously your partner, is it, my wife is really important in that. Yeah. My parents have been pivotal to, to that in my earlier years. Yeah. Um, and my my brother obviously is pivotal to that. So that family support yeah. of of the business is really important. Your still in the business yeah, yeah, yeah. he runs the yeah. percent business, yeah. and I run oh, okay. the fragrance shop business. So I think that's really really important. Um, and I think the friends that you surround yourselves with it's important. Where you read, it's, it's a cliche thing where the five people you hang around with on average are the, are the five yeah. people you become yeah, yeah, in yeah. essence yeah. so as long as you've got five smarter people than you or five yeah. people who are aspiring to do different things and that could be from business to you know personal sports related or whatever yeah. it is you know you accomplish a lot more I think and you grow in that way I've been part of YPO uh, and that's been really intrinsic I've got a different set of friends from that uh, network as well that yeah. I've developed a lot from I've learned from their education programs uh, I read a lot and uh, listen to a lot of podcasts yeah. um, and I read things that are relative to areas I'm interested in, uh, not just for the sake of reading, so yeah. it's something that I can learn from and actually add value to in my life yeah. and my business. You mentioned the mentor earlier, how important has that been? Very important because I wouldn't be here today, I don't think, if I didn't get that chance. You, yeah. Everybody in life needs that first opportunity and yeah. you know that opportunity if I didn't get that office and warehouse the money that my dad left obviously was very important and that yeah. was pivotal but if I didn't get that first I wouldn't have needed the money so you yeah. need the starting base of somebody opening that door yeah and um, unfortunately that gentleman passed away after a couple of years um, but within that two-year frame of when I was 
looking at setting up the business and building the business, he was very helpful. Yeah. Have you found yourself kind of repaying that uh, by doing that yourself as a mentor or you, you plan yeah, to do if, that? If people approach me um, and ha- I have done in the past, um, I had a couple of mentees in the past that I've helped and supported. Um, I, I suppose it's not on a formal basis, but there have been a number yeah. of people who've contacted me on a number of occasions uh, that I've helped yeah. with advice. Yeah. Um, of course, you've got to you've got to try and give that opportunity when yeah. you can. Yeah, we'll come towards the end now. Then, um, what's the future? What what does the future look like? You think for what do you think? First of all, what's the future like in general in your industry, the high street? Where do you think it's going? And then and then for fragrance shop percent. I mean, there's. I think that the store closures from a bricks and mortar basis, you're going to see quite a bit more to come through. Um, just because of the state of the market and the way the current rental model works from a landlord perspective I, I think needs to be uh, changed I think that's not going to happen overnight so it's going to take some time so you're going to get some retailers that obviously are not going to be able to call and go through the CBAs that we see yeah. and go through the process of cutting down the yeah. stores and there's a number of reasons for that it's it could be down to the businesses that weren't involved Along with the times, the businesses couldn't evolve because they've got too much debt on the business, yeah. uh, or they've got massive leases yeah. tied up to them. So yeah. there's a number of things that are probably limiting to yeah. what they can do. Um, so you're going to unfortunately see, I think, a number of closures still. But on the backdrop, there are still going to be very successful retail businesses in bricks and mortar and online. Yeah. Um, and I think the two work very well. So if you're a multi-channel business and your product area can't be sold necessarily by Amazon. Yeah. Then, yeah, yeah. then I think you, you, you've still got opportunity and you're still going to see great businesses a number of great businesses that don't get highlighted that are doing extremely well that yeah. still run yeah. extremely well yeah. um, you talked about Toys R Us before this ring but Entertainer if yeah. you look at how yeah. amazing that business yeah. is doing yeah. you know, so there's a number of businesses in specific yeah. sectors that are still performing extremely well I think it's interesting as well some of the like um, I don't know what area they were built in but in, in, in the cities now you tend to have like a new style, what was like yeah. a US style shopping mall, and yeah. you have the old fashioned one. So, if in Liverpool, you'd have Liverpool one, and you might have St. John's or yeah. whatever it is. Yeah. And when you look, I think they, I think it's like the Liverpool one that's like the struggle because it's just so yeah. expensive. But yeah. the ones that were the the ones that you thought would have gone by, yeah. the older yeah. ones, they're smaller, yeah. and they're a bit more. They still have the footfall. Yeah, I think it's the rental model again, isn't it? So yeah. If the rents were slightly cheaper in Liverpool one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think yeah. you might have a different yeah. situation. But do you think they'll have to just do that in the end and rents will come down? I, I think it will have to change. I think the Americans are changing it, you know, where the rent leases are, are shorter, maybe three years yeah. at a time. There's more of a turnover rent attached to it rather than it being fixed rent. You know, so that gives, you've seen it at all the market where yeah, yeah. it works on a turnover basis and I think it gives everybody an equal chance to earn you, know, you don't feel like you're just working for the landlord. Yeah. Everybody wins out of the pie. Yeah. And I think something like that needs to happen. You know, the office sector has been changed by WeWorks in a sense. Yeah. You know how that's come about. Yeah. You know, and you've got Airbnb in the sense of the yeah, yeah. hotels and re- you know, resident residential yeah. lettings model. So I yeah. think a similar thing needs to happen in the retail space. You know, and I think it's going to be transformative. But because it's got such a large amount of money tied up within that sector from funds and mm. pension funds mm. and banks who have lent against these on long-term leases it's not going to unravel that easily yeah you know, so I, I do think it will take place but it, it'll take it'll be slower to start with sure the fragrance shop then what's your strategy in and does as online has that opened it up um to non-uk or are you still in the uk at the moment or is it we're, we're in the uk online we're going to go international from this year mm-hmm. um so we're looking at germany as the first market and then we'll penetrate other european countries um but our strategy is is about differentiating and i suppose the key things we look at is what can we bring that's unique to the fragrance shop how can we make it a surprise to the customer and whatever we bring it needs to be repeatable you know so that we can make sure we can define that across the business but that whole immersive experience has to be part of that whole aspect, um, whether it's in store or, yeah. or online. Yeah. And you know, as where we see, um, we're, we're going to bring in what we call a fragrance fitting um, here, whereby fragrance is quite a complex area, um, and 
quite confusing. We've got amazing staff, brand ambassadors, but as people have got more used to going on their mobile phone and trying to understand what to buy, uh, we're going to bring this fragrance fitting where it says three or four questions, which will enable them to be given three fragrances for them to trial. You know, it's the power of three. Okay. And I think that those three fragrances, if they rate them, uh, we'll, we've got clever algorithms which will then match them to the right fragrance till they get the ultimate yeah, ones that yeah. are best suited to them. Yeah. And it just allows them to share that knowledge um, across their family, friends, sure. you know, from, a, from a social media perspective. And then hopefully they get the right gifts yeah. uh, because they've chosen fragrances that yeah. for them. And then we think that will be unique for us. And you know, we've been working on that for a number of months now to create the whole data and the algorithm aspect and how that works. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much yeah, for coming in. I really thank appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. So that's Thanks. the end of the podcast. Um, it's available in all the links below. Uh, it's on YouTube, Spotify, and iTunes Store. So yeah, the links from the below. Thanks for listening. Take care. Bye now. Thanks. Thank you, mate. Really good.